to understand that prayer is such a vital part of our relationship with God. It, you know, it is, it is everything. It's been said that the church moves forward on its knees. Prayer is so vital. And if, this, if there's one thing in, in the Christian faith, especially in the culture and the time in which we live, if there's one thing that's neglected, if we just were honest, it's our prayer life, right? I mean, it's, it's sadly, it's, it's, for most of us, it's, it's worse than our time in the Word. It's just, it's a reality. And, and granted, we are so busy. I mean, most of us. It's just, I mean, how many of you, it was a struggle just getting here and, and getting, the, you know, it's just, it's just a hard thing. Churches all over the nation are realizing that Wednesdays are just almost impossible to do anymore, you know, for the family, especially in big cities where people commute and they've got the kids and, and all of that. So um, it's awesome that everybody's out here. Um, so we're going to be talking about prayer for the next four weeks, and, and our lesson one here is the title is, For a Life-Changing Encounter with Jesus, Pray. For a Life-Changing Encounter with Jesus, We've got to Pray. Now, throughout the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at some prayers in the Bible and the people that prayed those prayers and the impact of those prayers and the implication and all that. But right now, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 is, is right there in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Beatitudes. We've got Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I was just in Israel a few months ago and got to stand on the hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, and, and Capernaum is just right down below us, a, a city where Jesus and his disciples hung out often. Jesus did a lot of teaching in Capernaum. It's beautiful. We were there earlier this year uh, than, than the year uh, in 2012 when I was there, and, and it was just rolling green hills. I mean, just absolutely, because this time, you know, a few months later, it's all dried and burnt up. So there's no doubt, I'd like to think that Jesus was up there in springtime when he was teaching all this, and it was beautiful instead of all burnt up like uh, Arizona looks like right now. <laughs> and so it's important to understand as we look at this title, for a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, we've got to pray. Prayer is the key to life and ministry. To think that we can move forward in, in our walk with God, in our struggles. I mean, who doesn't have things going on? Life is full of things going on. If, if you don't have anything going on, maybe you should come up and teach us because I've got all kinds of things I should be praying about, you know? I mean, it's just, it's just almost overload on things that I could be crying out to the Lord over. But prayer is that key to our life and our ministry. And it can unlock the doors that even seem to be closed and opportunities that seem to be closed that might even seem non-existent. You know, I, for me, I, I call it traction. I, I need to, I want to gain some traction. I need to get some traction in my Christian life. It just seems like I'm stuck in the mud. You ever get there? You know, and, and, and I need to increase my prayer life. I need to increase my life with the Lord. And, and so I'd like to read with you an opening. Uh, hold your finger if you have your Bible in Matthew 6. But turn, you can turn to Galatians Chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Remember, prayer is, is this essential encounter with the Jesus that died on the cross for you and I. We can encounter him. We can experience him. And it says here in Galatians 2, 20 and 21, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he says, so he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. That, that is such a, a powerful verse. The gospel's just there. The idea is that as we live out this life, this born-again life, we carry about us and in us the death of Christ. 
You, you don't get up in the morning and leave the death of Christ beside. Paul never did. He carried about in his body the death of Christ. You see, the death of Christ is, is planted in our hearts, as I said, Sunday, that the life of Christ would be manifest. So when it comes to prayer, because Christ died and, 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 he, and, he, and he experienced that new life, that resurrection life, there's, there's, this, there's this dying this, this to the flesh. And I think that's why that it's so hard to pray. You see, it's so contrary to my flesh. Now, when, I'm, when I'm walking with the Lord, and, and I'm good with God for the most part, things are going along pretty good, church is going well, marriage is going well, I'm praying. But when I really need to be praying the most is when it's the hardest, right? Our emotions get all wrapped up in things. And we get our eyes off of, off, of, off of God and what He can do and His power and His resources. He, he has everything. And we get our eyes on, on our limited resources, which are pretty almost minute, like nothing. We can't bring about the change. Only God can. So on the screen, we want to live our lives. We want to live lives, excuse me, that are lives that are one, purposeful, right? Which means lives that are directed by God. That's a person, that's, a, that's a, a purposeful life, one that's directed by God, if you're a note taker. Number two, we want to live lives that are powerful, lives that are, on, are, uh, are, a, are a display of God's presence. That, that's a powerful life. And three, we want to live lives that are pleasing, Lives that are obedient towards God. These are, these are three things that we, we really want to put out there. We would say that these, as well as other attributes like these, represent a life that is close to God, wouldn't we? And rightfully so. Prayer brings us closer to God. It puts us in, in His will. It makes us effective for His kingdom. Prayer does. Prayer rightly affects my holiness. Prayer rightly affects my obedience. Prayer rightly reflects my trust and my faith in God and not myself. These things are simple, but we lose sight of them. But could it be that the reason God's people don't pray as we should is that 1A, we don't understand prayer like we should. Or B, we simply underestimate prayer and the power of it. As I think about these things, these things are something that we, as we go through our lesson in Matthew 6 tonight, please be thinking about these things in your life and how they pertain to you. We need to begin by praying and praying for revival among God-fearing believers in, this, in, the, in our world today, Right? That, that we would see our need for prayer. And, and I'm going to say this. Things are going to get crazy. We've been teaching, and, and, and we're almost done with Sunday. We're going to finish 2 Timothy. And, and he's warning against false teachers, and we're living in a day and an age where, where things are just getting crazy. It's chaotic. It's, it's insane how wrong things can be. I was watching on YouTube today, you know, I was kind of digging around and, and looking at, you know, California's wanting to ban the Bible, right? Well, just exactly what way do they want to really ban the Bible? Well, in this way, the, the way that for, for same sexual, people that have same sex attractions or people that feel as though they, they have a transgender or identification issues, uh, it, it would be wrong for me to hand them a Bible to quote them a Bible scripture, to hand them a trifold that, that says, hey, this is the way, this is how you can be delivered with scripture on it. 
Why, why are they so? This is the group that's upset. This is, this is the reason why it's what, A.D. something, the, 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 the thing? Okay, so this is the reason why. In a court of law, this is their point. The scriptures are fraudulent. The word of God is fraudulent. This is exactly their, their approach. That it can't be believed, it's fraudulent. It's not real. It's a lie. That we're living a lie, and then we're preaching and proclaiming a lie. They're not the ones living a lie. We're the ones living a lie. That the message is fraudulent. The word of God is under attack for, for, for it being fraudulent by all means. And, and I think about that, and I, and I think about the day in which we live and, and the chaos and how we need to be praying. And I think in these last days, this, this Christian culture today should be praying more and harder than any other culture in church history. But sadly to say, there's a good chance that might be our demise. If there's going to be a falling away, large or small in the last days, I think it's going to be because of the lack of prayer. The lack of calling on the presence and the power of God to save and to deliver and to protect and to provide. We need to be praying for revival. And express, right? Express. Prayer expresses a desire to know God and to know Him deeper. Prayer does. In a relationship with the God who expressed only love and goodness towards us. That's amazing. So on the screen, this starts by asking, or this has to start by asking ourselves, uh, just a few questions, like, how do we pray? To whom do we pray? How often should we pray? What should we pray? Right? And what should we expect from our prayers? See, if we can't get some answers, let's see if we can't get some answers from Jesus and, uh, and from his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 5 through 13. He says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, Pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain reputitious, reputations as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask him. Let's stop there before we get into this model prayer. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. So when you pray, rule one here, he says don't be like a hypocrite. Literally meaning don't be like a stage player. Don't be an actor. Don't come pretending or being a pretender. Ironically, most of the time, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders just... <laughs> in crazy ways, right, for being hypocrites, constantly. They were worried about the outside of the cup and not the inside of the cup, so to speak. And here, he's rebuking them for the way that they pray. They do so to be seen by men because they want, they want a reward, a spiritual reward, you know, from men not really concerned about getting what they want from God, just those around them. Could that be our problem? Matthew twenty three thirteen says this on the screen. He says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow the, those excuse me, who are 
entering to go in. That, that, is, a, that is a powerful, powerful verse. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Their hypocritical ways, specifically regarding prayers, were not only hurting themselves, but they were hindering those around them. He says, not only are you not able to enter in, but you're hindering those from around you from entering in. Hypocrisy hurts everyone. It didn't open the kingdom of heaven, but rather it shut it and shut it up for others as well. Matthew 5, 44 says this on the screen, but I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray, ironically, for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This is the contrast between the hypocrite and the Holy One in the eyes of Christ. One who's be, wanting to pray, to, to be seen by men, would never pray a prayer like this. One who has a broken and contrite heart, who's humble in nature, that wants God's best all the way around, will pray a prayer like this. One of the things that I see here is that, you see, with the hypocrite, with the Pharisees and the scribes, their prayers were actually the problem, and they were in their own way. May, may I say this? We, we got to get out of our own way. We got to get out of our own way. You know, you know, the right way to pray is genuine. Just genuine before the Lord. Just be real. Just be straight. Can I say God's got big shoulders? You ever think, I, if I really told him that, I would surprise him? Well, may I remind you, he knows everything before you ask you know, he knows the sin you're going to confess. He knows that he knows the thing you, you'd already have done before you even did it. He's waiting on us to come and confess our sin. He's waiting on us to ask for that thing that we need provision for. He's, he's already up there asking. He's waiting. I mean, he's waiting for us to ask. So I don't know why here we don't do it. Here Jesus gives a strong lesson on prayer. Again, for, for a hypocrite, a hypocrite would not have the depth spiritually to pray for his enemy. But when you pray, our passage in Matthew 6 says, go into your room. So we, we, we see the genuineness of it. Now, is that to say that we can't pray any other way than to going into our prayer closet? First off, I doubt that very many of us have our prayer closet. Now, I've talked to many of you, and you, you know, your commute is a prayer time. Well, you're alone. You're alone with God. And I think it's probably safer that you pray than talk on your cell phone or text. I think 347 would be safer if everybody was praying, right, as they were commuting to work and home. <laughs> with their eyes open, of course. You can pray with your eyes open, right? Right? So here, but uh, he says, I want you to go into your go into your room, basically, which means here in the original Greek, it means a storeroom or a secret room. We can translate that a closet. I was recently at a congregate's home, or somebody comes through here, you know, and, and uh, went there, they bought a new home and went to bless it last week, and, and the, you know, a lot of these two stories have a little closet up under the stairwell, you know, and she opened the door, and there was like nothing in there but her Bible, a devotion, and some post-it notes on the wall. And I was like, wow, that's pretty awesome, man. That's right, that's pretty awesome. So she's got this place that she goes. This is what the Lord's talking about here. A special place where God longs to meet with us. Here the Lord makes the point of finding a place where we can be alone with Him. A secret place. For God is in the secret place. I, I, you know, you, have you ever tried to just concentrate on anything with racket, with noise? It's like that with God. You, you and I, we can't concentrate on God. You can't hear him because he's speaking in that still, small voice. And so he wants to take us to that secret place where I can just be alone with him. Have you ever had an encounter 
chances are, if you go back in your mind over your walk with God, where a time when you were seeking with everything you had, he led you away. Think about it. When Jesus, when he had to get away, he, he, he got away from people and he went up on a mountain to pray, right? Isn't that his deal? Or he went up on the Mount of Olives. He, you know, he went away. He went away. He withdrew. When it was time to pray, he withdrew. Many times to be alone with the Father. What an example. Luke 12, 3 says, Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear, in inner rooms, will be proclaimed on the housetops. That is a powerful verse. The Lord hear, hears the deep, quiet prayers of the night as well as those silent prayers of our inner rooms. There is a promise in here. He will be proclaimed on the housetops. Right? Your, 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 your prayer request it will be proclaimed on the housetops. It will be made known. It will be published is what the scripture says in the Greek. It will be published what you've confessed in the dark will be heard in the light. Now, that might cause you to shiver. But you know, that's the right way. That's the healing way. That's God's way. On the housetops could mean in the open. But the word also has the idea of a place of meditation. You know, it reminds me of Acts 10, 9, where Peter went up on the rooftop, right, of Simon the Tanner to pray when that sheet was lowered down. Oh no, Lord, you know I'm a good Jew. I won't eat all that stuff. Shut up and listen to me. <laughs> time of meditation he was up on that rooftop and when you pray he says do not use vain repetition as the heathen do vain repetitions literally mean means to stammer don't stammer don't over repeat yourself and don't over repeat things don't use many idle words the hypocrite does this the vain person uses vain words a humble person uses humble words a broken person prays in a broken way. The heathen, though. <laughs> this means one who is an alien to worshiping the true and living God. You ever wonder what? You know, you're a heathen. What's a heathen? A heathen is simply one who is a complete alien to what it means to worship the one true living God. Don't be like the heathen. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask. I, I really like this when it comes to prayer, guys. Romans 8, 26 and 27 is powerful. Listen to what it says. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought isn't that the truth? But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Lord knows the things that you and I have need of before we ask. Why? might you ask first remember when you pray you pray to a sovereign God who's a creator he's omniscient omnipresent right he's just all these things but there's there's more at work than what meets the eye you have God the Father sitting on the throne in heaven you have God the Son Jesus Christ our Savior today at the throne making intercession for the saints interceding 
for you and I. You, you, I don't know if you ever think about it. You think, well, Jesus died on the cross and his work's done right now. Jesus' work is not done and you should be praising God. It's not done. He's so at work in our lives. To think that my Savior is in heaven making intercession. He's interceding for me. And he's doing it in perfect unity, perfect harmony with the Spirit. So much that this verse says. But check this out. He says, so the Spirit also helps in our weakness. Weakness means lack of strength. It speaks of one's unhealthiness. Can I, can I share that with you? Listen, he is, he, likewise, the Spirit is helping us in our weakness, in our sickness. When you think, I, I don't know what to pray, and I can't pray. I'm not strong enough to pray. I don't know enough about the Bible to pray. I don't know enough about God to pray. I'm too much of a sinner to pray. You, the list, can, we can just go on and on and on. In my weakness, God is made strong. And it's in my weakness here that the Spirit takes over. Have you ever just, have you ever just, you know, sat there silent? A lot of people want to focus on, and, and it, it's biblical speaking, in tongues is biblical, and, and it is part of a prayer life, but I want to say this. What, what, if, what if you were really, really broken and you just sat there? And you just sat in his presence, not knowing what to say. And just let him speak to you. Let him minister to you in your weakness. You know, in Jim Cimbala's book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, that was printed in, in 97, amazing, amazing book. He makes, this, he makes this statement. He says, I discovered an astonishing truth. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Our weakness, in fact, makes room for his power. Do you ever think like that? I don't think like that sometimes. That's a powerful statement. It says he, he took our infirmities and he, and he bore our sickness is, is what it's saying here. Intercession. Intercession here in our passage, it means to intercede for another. To, right, intervene, if you would, intervene between two people. It is the act of interceding, the act of prayer, the act of making a, pet a petition on behalf of another. And it says, and it says that God and the Spirit are interceding. Some might say, well, I'm an, I'm an intercessory prayer warrior. I, I love, well, praise God for that. We need more of that. Please, by any means, feel free to intercede for Denise and I anytime you want, you know. <laughs> Go before the Father on our behalf. That's what that means. An intercede. Because the, the work of the Spirit is just that when it comes to prayer. So the Spirit as well as Jesus, we see it all at work here, ministering in this way. I think it's something we need to kind of plug into, grab a hold of, become a, make it a part of our lives. But, but all this ministry is taking place, even in our fear, even in our lack of faith, again, even in our, in our, in our lack of spiritual strength, even when we are not at our healthiest spiritually, God is at work. C can, I, can I remind us of something as we are praying and making, and prayer requires making yourself vulnerable. So as we're praying and we're making ourselves vulnerable to God, right? May I, may I remind you that, that he, he, he so knows. 
how to perfectly deal with you and I and our situation. He, he, so know, he so perfectly knows how to, how to handle it. He knows how to intervene. So here, huh, verses 9 through 13, most of us call it the Lord's Prayer, right? Right? Guys, let me, let me just shoot straight. I, I, I don't call this the Lord's Prayer at all. I call this the Lord's model for prayer because I, it's a wrong. Jesus couldn't and wouldn't pray this prayer. It, it was for his disciples. If you really read it, and we'll look at it right now, Jesus wouldn't have and couldn't rightfully pray this prayer. You want to know what the, real, the Lord's Prayer really is? Go to John. Go back and read John chapter 17 where he's literally praying, he's interceding. All that I'm teaching you right now, he is doing that for you and I today. Go back and read John. We'll, we'll study John in, in not next week, but the week after. But read it. It's so powerful. I mean, the let is the Lord's Prayer. But here, the Lord gives him this model. I mean, because you see, as he's up there on the Sermon on the Mount, prayer becomes a topic. And in the Sermon on the Mount here above Capernaum, he's, he's got disciples at his feet, in his presence. All those that were following him just to be fed or just to get something have left. These that are listening to this sermon are disciples. And, and, and so Jesus makes this statement. He says, look, in this manner, therefore pray. Could it be that, that they were so confused, like us today, really, about prayer? Could it be they were so confused because they'd had such a poor example from the Pharisees and the scribes? Because Jesus totally called them hypocrites, like, regarding prayer more than once. Even these men by faith, Jesus said, you know, follow me. And they dropped their nets and they followed after him. They still didn't know how to pray. And so Jesus here, he says, in this manner, he gives them an illustration, an example of this prayer. Pray like this, our Father. Right? Our Father in heaven, how it be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wow. Wow. What, what an amazing, amazing topic. So here, here's, here's the way I want you to pray. Our Father, Guys, it, it starts, it's relational. Uh, we're not going to pull out any great big thing, but this is relational between you and him. It's personal. It doesn't mean that we should only pray just to the Father. Again, this is an example. But you have to give honor to the one you're praying to. And I like here, he addresses him, Father. Just as we close our prayers in honor, we say, in Jesus' name. And when you pray to the Spirit, Holy Spirit, right? Fall on me. Fill me with your Spirit today, right? But there's this, there's this relational thing happening. There's this, it's personal. So whether we, we, we hear, uh, we approach prayer whether it's to the Father, whether it's to the Son, or whether it's to the Spirit. We pay directly to Him. What, what access, what access do we have? How it be your name, too. Prayer should begin with and have with it an element of praise and worship praise and worship, like reflecting on his word and on his promises as well as 
his strength and power to save. Do you remember? You know, a faithful prayer is, is one that, that is, is reflective. A faithful prayer is one that's reflective. As, as I'm praying for this new trial today, I'm reflecting on the goodness of God in the past trial. How, how he has delivered me, how he set me free, how he provided, how he came through for me or, or for the one I was praying for. Recently, our daughter was in a car accident. Her car was totaled. She's 23. Denise and I chose to let her handle this on her own, dealing with the insurance companies, the whole process. Of course, we were there for her, but we had to let her just, you deal with this. And a couple times, she about lost her mind. <laughs> Bless her heart. She's a sweetie. But she, about, she did. She lost her mind. I just throw her under the bus right now. She lost her mind. And, 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 but, you know, I, after I calmed her down, I, I said, listen, the, the, you're 23. Dad's going to almost 51. Okay? This is the thing. God's going to see you through this. But the purpose is that you look back on this. And the next time you come against a trial... You just got that much more faith. I mean, God, you got me through this. You saw me through. You were with me through this whole thing. You walked me right through this thing. So the next trial, it's, it's just not so bad. You know, you, you, you have faith. You have trust. You've seen God work. But how, how horrible is it when mature Christians who've been walking with him for 20 years fall into some trial and we're like, ah! You know, we're losing our ever-living mind. And God's just going, what are you doing? I've, I've came through. I've been so faithful. I've sh I, how many times? You, you, the problem is you're not remembering. You haven't remembered. You haven't wrote any of these things down, have you? you? Have you remembered any of these things I've done for you? No, you haven't. Go back and remember. Isn't this what he did with the children of Israel? All through the Old Testament. The whole purpose was that they remember what God did. How important is that? If you want to find your, you know, I mean, all that trial, it's, it's got purpose. And if we find, want to find ourselves faithful in that, we've got to reflect back on the goodness of God. How it be your name. Your kingdom come. Right? Totally yielded to his kingdom. To his plan. Your kingdom come. The, the, look, this model prayer, I believe that, it, that it's... it's um, it's speaking of a sovereign God, a creator God. It reflects God's power. That's the point of this model prayer. Our prayer should do the same thing. Our prayer should reflect his sovereignty. It should reflect his creativity, his authority. Our prayer should be all these things on display. If we're putting all of our trust in him. Something to think about. I like this. Your will be done. <laughs> My will. Wait a second. That's the part where I got to stop because we pray our will. And then we want to say, God, please do this. You know, it, it, it's like, is it really, I want your will to be done. This model prayer is, look, is just revealing God's desire and ability to meet our needs. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. God knows how to provide the need far better than we do. Therefore, we are to seek him and ask him for those needs and, the, and for the needs of others. It's what we do. I've said this so many times and I, I hope it gets into you. It, there are so many things in the faith that are so contrary to the way that we live this life here on this earth. We raise our kids to be independent, right? Independent, not dependent, right? I mean, if Trey is totally dependent on mom at 20, 25, well then, I mean, there's a problem, you know? It, seriously, I mean, we've we got to go to a doctor and have you tested, you know? We have to learn 
to be not independent. We are not growing in our independency of God. We should be growing in our dependency of God. It's backwards. The older I get and the wiser I get, the more I should trust him. And the sooner and the quicker I should run to him and trust him. Right? And lean on him and look to him. But it, it, it so goes against the grain of everything I know here. And, get, and forgive us our debts. I think that's a part that we forget. Forget our debts. Here's the big one, right? God forgives sin. W within this model prayer, he reminds them, you always come and say, Lord, will you forgive me? Wash me, clean me. I'm, I just make me right. God is righteous. Sunday, we talked about how Paul was confident in standing before a righteous God. He was excited. The righteous judge. I'm kind of afraid. I'm not as confident as Paul, to be honest with you. But you know, if my prayer life was, was, was more than what it is now, maybe I'd be a little more confident, a little less fearful of standing before God. That, that my sin is washed, it's clean, it's, I'm, I'm in right standing with God. I'm good. Because I confess my sin often. As we come before him, it, there's got to be this transparency, right? There's got to be this transparency. How foolish would it be for me with, with, with sin in my life? With, I, I lost my temper. My, I know my wife's upset at me. And I'm praying for the needs and the prayers of, of Chuck and Dora over here. Well, the scripture tells us my prayers really don't get much higher than the ceiling until I go make things right with my wife. Confess my sin. It's a good place to start. I, I kind of wonder why it's down the list so far. I have to ask the Lord that when I get to heaven. But, you know, I, I think it's a good place to say, you know, God, you know, forgive me for losing my temper at Mark and, and eating his cheeseburger. Whatever it might be. God is interested in forgiving sin. And it's there for the asking through prayer. So, he goes on and he says, forgive us our debts. <laughs> Here's this, as we forgive our debtors. I, I, I know this is really hard. <laughs> really, really difficult here. Right? Jesus illustrates for us here just how simple it is. Will you forgive me of my sin as I forgive those who have sinned against me? It's pretty basic. And how could I experience the forgiveness of God without extending it to somebody else? I become a hypocrite, don't I? Our prayer should always contain it, contain this brokenness and this repentiveness regarding sin, whether it be ours or those we're praying for. Are, 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 you, are you broken? Are you broken and, and repented? I know this sounds silly. Are you broken and repented for the person you're praying for? I, I, I know they have to confess their sin. I, I know doctrinally. But, but am I praying? Am, am I broken for them? I mean, I think that's, that's the deal. You know, as we come, this whole broken and contrite heart and contrite spirit, this is, this is what he's really, this is the, kind of the, the track that he's on. The Lord himself. As we forgive our debtors. We can't hold grudges, can't hold things inside. That hinders our prayers. And do not lead us into temptation. Wow. Is there any doubt? Right? Why would the Lord lead me into temptation? I don't know. The Lord was led up on a mountain to be tempted. Right? I think there's a part of Job's story. The Lord allowed him to be tempted. Sometimes our struggles, our difficulties, they're times of temptation where we can either choose to be victorious over them 
or choose to fail. But here in this prayer, Jesus tells them to pray, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us. God is a deliverer by his very nature. He's, he is a deliverer. He says here, keep us from the trap of temptation. God is at work. He's at work in protecting us. He's at work in guarding us from that which might hurt us or not be good for us. <laughs> Only a nut would ask God to guard and protect themselves and those they love during their time of prayer. Right? Or not do that. Excuse me. Only a nut would not do that. Typo in my notes. Maybe I just need to walk away from those things. They messed me up. So, so only a nut would not ask God, right, to do so, to, pr to protect, to, to intervene, to step in, to not lead them into temptation. How many of you have, you know, kids, right? Isn't that like a constant prayer? You know, but for ourselves, Lord, today, keep me from temptation. Help me to be victorious over these things. That's God's plan. That's his purpose. Here, he wants us to pray. Seek his help. Seek his power. Deliver us from the evil one. And above everything, the Lord desires to save us, right, from the powers of darkness. He wants to break those chains of influence of the enemy in our lives. He alone can deliver. So our prayer is, God, deliver me. Deliver me. Set me free. Set me free. Intercede. Whether I'm praying for myself or I'm praying for others. I want to I say this. In closing, I want to wrap this all up by saying, nobody starts out their walk with God just all shiny like a new penny. Now, in God's eyes, you know, you're made born again. But God has got work to do. I remember Denise and I. We, were, we, we came from broken homes. We had the worst example of what it was to be a father and a husband and a mother and a wife. I had the worst example of what it meant to be a man. It was pathetic. If, if what, what, ex, what little example we had, it was bad. And so in our prayers, it was, it was always constant confession. It was always constantly directed, God, we need you. We can't do this apart from you. We, we don't stand a chance. <laughs> you know, this marriage doesn't stand a chance. These kids of ours don't stand a chance. We're washed up. If, if, if there's any testimony to anything good God has ever done, it's because the reality is we know we can't do it, and we can't be it, and we can't accomplish it. But God can, and God wants to. And if God wants to and he can, then what, what, what's my response? What should my response be regarding prayer? It should be to plug in, to believe, to trust, to press in for what he has, to believe his word to take him at his word, to believe that he wants to and can make us into the people, the men and women that he wants us to be. That's, that's, that's prayer. That's prayer. I, I'm not there. I'm still here. I'm here. You're, we're still here. We're not there. And although I, we look back and we're, we're not even close to the people we were, right at 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. God has transformed us. He's restored us. He's renewed us. But it's a constant, constant prayer. It, it's, the prayer doesn't change. If I stop, if I change that, if I, if I think that I, I don't need him anymore, that's where I, stop going, I start going backwards and stop going forwards. And we see that here in this model prayer. For yours is the kingdom. For yours is the power and the glory forever. 
This is the equivalent of saying, in Jesus' name, so be it. It's your kingdom, Jesus. It's your power, Jesus. It's your glory, Jesus, in my life. There's, there's so much here in this prayer. And, and, and this week, come back, because we're going to look at some wonderful illustrations like John chapter 17 over the next three weeks. And we're going to look at these prayers and how these men and women, how they prayed, how they sought God through their difficulty. Guys, when it's the most essential time, most important time for us to pray, it's going to be the hardest to pray. It's going to be the hardest to pray. That's when you need to pray the most. Right? I mean, I mean, it, it's just so important. I, I think of Jesus when he, when he taught the disciples how to deal with demonic influence. He, he told them, he went out and they, they got their butt handed to him. They were unable. And he said, look, I, I forgot to tell you, <laughs> these only come out by fasting and prayer. What is fasting and prayer? It's denying myself. Fasting. Fasting and prayer is, is pulling back from the situation, isn't it? It's, step, it's stepping back. It's getting out of the situation. And, and, and allowing God's power to be on display. I think that's one of the things that disciples learn from that. Instead of jumping in and going, ah, 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 and casting out demons, right? You know? They, they just learn to draw back and, 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 and fast and pray and focus on the power of God. Some powerful illustrations in prayer. And so I hope that we can be encouraged to pray. And I hope, I pray to God that you guys are praying for this ministry and, 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 and all that God has in store for it. Guys, let me, let me say this. Doing ministry, especially this, this, this is, we, we planted a church for six and a half years in Tennessee, and then we came here, and, and praise God, this was already kind of up and going in a lot of ways. But, but doing church in, in here like this, it, I relate it to flying a kite, <laughs> you know? You, you, you just, you wait, you, you're waiting for the wind. You're waiting for the spirit to pick it up, right, that wind. And, but you, you're just running up and down the street, you know, and you're just panting. And you're running, and you, and you catch a little wind, you feed a little string, and you run some more. <laughs> Your tongue's hanging, and you're running, and you feed a little bit more string, and you're running back and forth. And, you know, and for, if, when it comes to flying a kite, I have to pray, because I don't, can't fly kites. If I can get a kite in the air, it's totally because of God. So, but but it's, it's, it's work. It, it takes prayer. It, it's a lot of effort to get up over that hump, and, and you know, and God's doing amazing things. I want to tell you, in January, the third week in January, this is the secret. This is the secret. The third week in January, we had a church family meeting. Some of you guys were here. And, and when I got here two years ago, we were going to just cut back and, and, and just save and save and save. You know, if, if God's going to do an amazing thing, we've got to get out of here. Everybody knows that. We've got to get our own standalone building, get our own property. And so we've been doing that. And, and from what we had in January, the third week in January, today there's over, there's over 40,000 more dollars in savings this year alone. If we stay on schedule without any God doing any kind of miraculous like parting of the waters or doing something crazy, by, by December 19, we'll have everything we need as a down payment, like just to just go straight out and get the property we want and to build the thing we want. I mean, you know, we'll be in a good place. But it's, it's because of the faithful giving of this church. I mean, God is just doing great things. It is, it is amazing. It's not, it's not just one person with a whole bucket load of money, you know. It's not that we're going to turn those away. But, 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 but the thing is, you know what God's doing? I was praying, you know, when I got here, I had some things up my sleeve, and God shut the door on those. And after I did, you know what he said? He said, it's not going to be that way. I want this church to do it, because I know this church can do it. It's not going to be the gift of one great big person, so that, so that somebody else gets the glory. It's going to be done in such a way that God gets all the glory. It's not going to be one great big donor that does something crazy. 
It's going to be faithfulness. Faithfulness and prayer. And you know what? God's doing that. He's doing it. The last two months, I, I, I sit with Rhonda and I get a report at, at the end of each month and I almost fall out of my chair. I'm like, how can this be? Where's it all coming from? She goes, I don't know. I said, okay. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it's really, it's, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. And it, I'm just, I'm just, my jaw just is hanging down. God is doing amazing things. And so with all of that, let's remain faithful. Faithful to pray. Pray, pray, pray. Because it's the work of the Spirit. Right? It's like the fishes and the loaves thing. God has a way of accomplishing what He wants to do in our lives, too. In our lives. Pray. Seek His face. Right? Lord, thank You for tonight. Thank You for this church and all that You're doing, Lord, in our lives. And Lord, I'm so excited about the next three weeks and all that you're going to do. And I, I have this feeling that it's going to kind of spark some revival in just us individually and in our families, but in our church as well. Lord, that we would really just begin to lay things down and just seek you, God, to just turn the TV off for an hour and seek your face, to go out on the back patio and to get along with our spouse and pray. Maybe even get alone with, with another neighbor or another brother and sister in the Lord and, and pray to give it to you. And Lord, for those that are struggling, they, those that really need a touch, they need a healing, they need to be delivered, they've got kids that aren't, aren't walking with you. Lord, we pray right now in Jesus' name. God, we pray that you would intercede, that you would intervene, that you would deliver from that temptation and from the evil one, that you would put a hedge of protection around those that need that. Step in, for you are mighty to save. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.